welcome everybody. Nice to see everybody here. I'm kind of sad that this conference actually might come to a close. Um, so obviously I wasn't planning on giving this talk. So, um, and it's been well, a little over a month since I gave it and I never give the same talk twice. So I'm feeling a little guilty, but such as it may. How many people have used Jupyter Notebooks? Pretty much everybody. Is there somebody in here that hasn't used Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, all right, good, good. Um, has anybody used Jupyter Hub other than Peter? <laughs> okay, you can put your hand up, Peter. Okay, so much smaller group, great. So you guys are gonna keep, answer all the hard questions should they come up. Okay, so basically, the concept behind this presentation is um, I am kind of nerdy and I like this thing explainer book that the XKCD guy wrote and I thought, okay, Min's got this great tutorial he did at Pi Data London about Jupyter Hub, but it's not really a beginner's or um, an introduction to Jupyter Hub. It's really like, okay, you're gonna deploy Jupyter Hub, ready, set, go. Um, but it's great and I highly recommend seeing it. So this is more the concept of how to do Jupyter Hub in a thousand common words or so and make it so that you can understand the underlying architecture of Jupyter Hub, which would then make it easier to go through Min's tutorial and actually deploy it on your own. Um, so this presentation is, as I said, the user-friendly introduction to Jupyter Hub. It's not a deep dive, it's not a workshop, though I will give you links to um, Min's uh, talk and the tutorial that we crafted around it. And I will go back, actually, all these slides are on a bit.ly link at jupyterhub-pdc, um, so you don't have to worry about scribbling furiously to get it, things down. Um, who's it for? Pretty much anybody, um, but primarily scientists, engineers, researchers, people running user groups. Um, and again, it's just to make it easier to deploy Jupyter Hub and try it out and play around with it. Okay, so Jupyter Hub is essentially a way to give a Jupyter Notebook server to a number of people in a group. So you get a Jupyter Hub single notebook server, you get a Jupyter Notebook server, and so on. Um, for those of you that haven't worked with the notebook, the notebook is a couple of things. On one level, it's a document that you can share back and forth where you can annotate and uh, re mix code, video, podcast, audio, and visualizations. Talk to this guy about visualizations. And um, on another level, it's an environment, an interactive environment in which you can write code, run code, um, and on the final level, it's a web application, and by that I mean the user interface part is running in a browser, which is communicating over a web socket to a server running on your computer or somewhere else. So if we look at it from the architecture of just a single user notebook, you have the browser where you're entering in stuff and seeing stuff. You've got the Jupyter Notebook server which is basically handling um, getting the information in, passing it off to the different language kernels for the kernels to do their work, taking it back, and spitting it back to the user. Um, so think of the kernels as not the traditional like Unix kernels, but simply smart little language things that process in their own particular language. Um, and when we, as part of the Jupyter team, refer to a single user notebook server, we're talking about the notebook server and the kernels that you have installed. Um, and we will kind of 
for the rest of the presentation, use the little Jupyter symbol to symbolize a single user notebook server. And so Jupyter Hub, like we said before, has the ability to give a notebook server to each person in the group. So how does that work? Well, the hub, which is in the bottom left-hand corner, manages authentication of users. It is responsible for spawning these different single user notebook servers that will go to each individual user. And it gives the users their complete notebook server and access to it. Um, over on the right hand side is the actual notebook server which may or may not be running on the same system as the hub. But for the purposes of conceptualizing it, they are two distinct things. The servers, notebook servers and the hub are different and then there is a proxy that acts as the crossing guard or gateway, if you will, for routing information to the hub or to the single user notebook server, depending on what uh, you are doing at any given moment. Um, so the hub is made up of a user database, an authenticator, and a spawner. The users and their individual notebook servers are part of what we call Jupyter Hub and the proxy. Um, the proxy, his main job is to route, like if we do, okay, local host, well, not local host, but some URL slash hub, it will typically be an administrative command, so we're gonna route it directly to the hub. If it is a user, we're gonna route it to the user, and then depending on whether it's your first communication with the single notebook server for a user, or a later communication, it will authenticate you with the hub using the API and um, then get a response and store some sort of cookie on your local or on your individual notebook server. Uh, user database, place to keep information about the people using Jupyter Hub. Um, the authenticators are a combination of things. It could be um, PAM, it could be OAuth. Um, so there are different authentication modes that people have written. Some of it, the Jupyter team has written, some of them are people in the community that have written them. And um, it really is whether or not a user has the ability to access a notebook server and the spawner to then spawn a notebook server. I don't have my clicker today. And then the spawner is basically the worker bee that's sitting there and as it gets requests from the hub, other components, it will go out and it will say, okay, I'm gonna spin up a little single user notebook server here, another single user notebook server there, another one for you over here. And um, those could be in Docker containers they could be on the same physical system that you're on. It could be on a different system. So there's different spawners with different um, parameters. And putting it all together, you've kind of got the conceptual view on the right-hand side and Min's more block diagram on the left-hand side. So in this case, when we've got a group of six users, we're gonna have six individual notebook servers and um, each one will have their own and each one will have a URL that they access their notebook server with. So when would we want to use Jupyter Hub? Well, it could be used in a class where you have students that are doing homework and you might combine it with something like MB Grader, which does some automated grading of student assignments. So basically, you wanna ensure that the students have a baseline um, system with which to work. 
and they're all working with the same dependencies and things, and you don't want to necessarily have them install every single package if they're perhaps not technically savvy. So things like you might be teaching a GIS class, but it's more to geography students who aren't um, computer scientists. To have them Conda install or PIP install gets to be kind of burdensome for the TAs and the professors. So Jupyter Hub is a good alternative there. Um, if you're doing a short-lived workshop and installation is particularly annoying or hard, maybe you have to build different dependencies in C or something, you could use scikit-build, um, which would be an excellent option. And uh, you should check it out. And, um, but it simplifies having to have every person at, running, when you're running a workshop, have to build their own configuration. And you wind up with somebody's laptop that's like ancient, and somebody else's who's is brand new, and running beta version of whatever. Um, it simplifies that. Um, sometimes you just simply have a research group and a small cluster, and you just want to be able to share um, notebooks, files, um, database resources, whatever, with that small group, and that makes sense. Um, or if you want to use some on-site computing resources within an institution that you want to give access to, and um, in a in a sort of sort of a streamlined way. When would we not want to use Jupyter Hub? Um, remember, Jupyter Hub is authenticated and persistent. So if we want to just spin up a notebook and we don't care if it goes away after we're done with the session, then maybe Jupyter Hub's not what you need. Maybe it's something like TempNB that you can create anonymous notebooks and they go away. Uh, Binder is another project. It's not one that Project Jupyter um, manages, but we do have people that contribute to it. Um, Binder is actually um, TempMB that you can take a GitHub repo, upload it, and then people can um, use the notebook interactively. And um, it's really a nice thing, and Jeremy Freeman and the whole group that works on Binder has done a great job. Um, and then Sage Math Cloud is a good option if you want a hosted service that also enables real-time collaboration um, over a individual notebook. Um, as far as where would you find more resources if you wanted to try out Jupyter Hub, um, we have a couple of reference deployments. One is using Docker, and I think Peter probably could answer some of the questions on it. Um, and another one is using no Docker, because what we found was uh, some of the professors that were setting it up for their class didn't feel as comfortable with Docker or couldn't use it in their environment. So it's a, you can deploy it with a bunch of Ansible strip, scripts on a bare metal server. Um, again, MIMS PyData London Talk is um, fabulous, and I highly encourage you to uh, take a look at it. Um, we've also got a repo associated with it, so there is um, configuration scripts and things that let you configure it in several different ways that coordinate with the tutorial. And um, in July, we did a mini workshop. It was sort of um, HPC oriented, so high performance computing oriented, but we had different members of our community speak for about 15 minutes each on how they were using it, um, what they wanted changed, what they wanted added, um, and all of that is in um, a repo with markdown files, PDFs, and, and um, the video source as well. So. Um, in addition, uh, we have some documentation on Jupyter Hub. And um, for those of you that have been following Jupyter for a while, uh, several months ago we split out from the Jupyter organization because we started having a ton of repos and it was really hard to kind of keep track of everything. We put Jupyter Hub in its own organization. So all the Jupyter 
hub resources will be under the Jupiter Hub organization. And that's all I had for the formal Jupiter Hub presentation. I did tack on the end a little Jupiter Lab preview. Um, who's heard of Jupiter Lab? Okay, much less. Okay, cool. Um, Jupiter Lab is actually the next generation notebook, if you will. There was a great um, video on it that was done at SciPy 2016 by um, Jason Grout and Brian Granger. And I don't know if Steven Sylvester talked. Did you talk? No. Um, and it, well worth doing. What it does is it gives you um, multiple windows and there is a, eh, actually I'll pull up the, why can't I grab my little screen? Uh, so much for my presentation. Now you can read my email. There's nothing exciting. If you want to answer it, I'd be abundantly happy. Um, so at this point, I kind of would be willing to just throw it open to any kind of Jupyter question, whether it's Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Hub, and invite Peter and Thomas and others to jump in as they feel. Just uh, at BNL, we're using Jupyter Hub to do um, to provide notebooks to the scientists to work with, and we have it built up so that the Jupyter Hub and the individuals in the, in the individual servers run on one machine, and then the kernels actually run on remote machines, which are owned by the particular beam lines. So you can split the where the compute happens versus where all the management happens right. very nicely. Good. Thanks. Oh, don't ask me how it works. Don't ask you how it works. Did you install it or no? Dan did. Dan, okay. I, I can refer you to the person who knows how it works. Yes. <laughs> yes, so uh, let's say we have a group of people and uh, 10, 15 people. And obviously, I would like to have my own notebook to play with things and research. But then I may, have, may want to have a notebook that I share with three, four, five people. Share, I mean, we make take we make take turns to to work on the notebook, right? So I log in, they log in. Right. We just have to create like a user ID and share the user ID and password. Um, any, any maybe any work that sort of planned to address that? Okay. So there are plans down the road. There's no time frame on it yet to do real time collaborative editing of notebooks. Sage Math Cloud has it now, as far as I understand. Um, what, you, what we typically see people doing now, because we don't have that capability, is they will work on a notebook, they will check it into source control, somebody else will check it out, check in their changes. So it's, it's iterative, it's not a real-time collaboration, if you will, but it tends to work actually fairly well. Um, we do have a new project that folks have been working on called NB Dime, which allows you to do diffing of notebooks at, or merging notebooks, which was something that the community really wanted and I think makes it a lot easier to do notebooks um, under version control. And particularly before GitHub started rendering notebooks, it was really hard to know what was in a notebook until you actually loaded it up. So um, that will also help. Um, so I don't, that's probably the best I can do with your question. Cool. A round of applause for our amazing impromptu speakers. Thank you very much.